managing large storm flows in urban spaces. This morning, we've got joining us Chris Stoll. He's a project manager and a project engineer with Kennedy Jenks. We also have Geneva Schlepp. She is a civil engineering intern with Jacobs. And we have Ryan Dunn. He's a professional associate in infrastructure and advanced facilities at Jacobs. So I'll let them take it from here. No, oh, he's not. He is not in the list. He is crashing. And I will leave him to introduce himself and all the wonderful things he does. <laughs> all right, thank you. Great, thanks everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for sticking around for this um, kind of one of the final sessions here. So we were going for the record for greatest number of presenters in a single presentation. So hopefully we win that. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk today about managing large stormwater flows in urban spaces. Um, you'll see this is a conglomeration of projects, um, looking at large conveyance and treatment projects for um, stormwater flows and CSO flows in urban spaces. And we we brought this presentation together thinking that, you know, what are the similarities and the challenges that we face in, when we're working in dense urban environments? So, you know, we all did modeling and structural design and pipe material selection, but what are those other things that have really pushed projects and driven what um, these projects end up looking like and how they get constructed? So before we start there, let's talk about the driver for some of these projects. Um, you'll see here, this is a um, maybe a typical hydrograph in a CSO system or a storm system. Um, you've got different flows coming in at different times, depending upon what your precipitation is doing. Um, and your flow can definitely exceed the capacity of your system. Um, and what this does is it increases um, flows in these areas, especially as places uh, develop out. You see more pavement, more impervious area. Um, we see this kind of continuing. And then with climate change, you put that on top of that higher intensity, duration, and frequency of storms. So our three projects are going to touch on some different ways to solve these problems. So this first area of the hydrograph is looking at where you just have maybe some flows that are going above the capacity of your system. And so the solution here is to put in a larger pipe or a new pipe so you can get to that capacity and be able to, to move those flows in your system. Uh, the next one will be the ship canal water quality project. This is where you might have really high flows, but then those flows drop off. And so this is a good um, example of storage, taking those flows, storing them, and then sending them to a treatment plant once the, once the storm has passed. But if you have a system where you have flows coming in over the capacity of your system on a regular basis, but you don't see those flows drop off, this is where you actually need to take that volume and get it out of your system. And so this is more of a, a treatment um, based um, approach here. And then lastly, the question comes in, what about GSI? Um, we hear a lot about GSI being implemented um, and really we see GSI on a localized setting, being able to help with kind of increases in capacity, maybe marginal increases in capacity. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that as it's a, definitely a tool that um, folks are using to manage these flows. So when we started brainstorming this, we said, okay, what, if, what challenges have you faced? What have I faced? Um, and so we, we came up with this list of kind of everything we were looking at that we had faced. So how do we optimize hydraulics, including climate change? Um, how are we gonna deliver these projects? How are we doing community outreach? Um, working with permitting stakeholders, um, inadvertent discovery, property, construction staging. We started to piece all of these together and said, wow, we all face these same challenges, but we said, we can't talk about all of these. We've got, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes. How are we going to do that? So the dark blue boxes are what we're going to talk about today that we thought were really good common elements between our projects. So um, looking at community outreach, permitting, um, inadvertent discovery, um, coordination with adjacent projects, um, utility relocates both overhead and, and underground. So, um, and then just designing in an urban setting. What, is, what does that look like um, to, to get these projects done? So we're gonna start out with talking about the Jefferson Hood Surface Water Interceptor Project. Um, so this is for the city of Tacoma. You can see the, um, the alignment here. So it comes almost about the UW Tacoma campus um, and sends stormwater flows north out through um, a new outfall. And you'll see here, it crosses under 705, it crosses under railroad tracks, um, goes right by a university. 
uh, sound transit, light rail is right in the way as well. So um, lots of challenging pieces here. So this project was being driven by needing more uh, capacity within the system for the city of Tacoma. Um, they had a constrained system. They were also seeing additional growth within the city that was driving um, higher flows. And so the city identified a number of risks associated with the project that I'm gonna talk about here in a minute. But in order to address those, the city elected to go progressive design build. Um, this was a two-step process. Um, was total, the single contract was 26 million. Um, stage one was the pre-construction services or you know, design phase, if you think about it like that as well. Um, and then we are getting close to finishing construction um, on the stage two process, which was actually the negotiation of the GMP and actually breaking ground. And you can see these pictures of some of the flooding in downtown uh, Tacoma. Um, I drive by here regularly um, to get on the freeway. So um, it's kind of wild to see some of those flows coming up in, in these areas. So talking a little bit about the progressive design build um, project delivery. So the city selected a progressive design build team primarily on qualifications. This ended up being the J.W. Fowler, Kennedy Jenks team. And they really wanted a single point of responsibility for this. Um, they also wanted that single point so that it can increase collaboration and teamwork between the city and the design build team, um, develop solutions together, but understand the costs and risks associated with those solutions, um, and really try to foster some innovation and efficiencies between the designer and the builder when you actually have the folks on the team that are gonna be implementing it and designing it, you know, you can get more certainty in, in where things are going. Um, also the city liked that there was open book pricing on this. They could understand um, what the costs were, what was included in those. And also they could use that to negotiate the schedule and when things were gonna get done. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about too, that the permitting associated with this, um, having the, the builder on, on the team to actually say, here's how we're gonna do it, not just, well, we're assuming the contractor is gonna do it this way and we're proceeding that way. You can actually put together a plan and say, no, this is how we're gonna do it. So some of those project complexities and risks that I talked about, um, really a lot of crossings here, working in a pretty vibrant uh, downtown setting. Um, so there was tunnel construction beneath Sound Transit and BNSF rail corridors. Um, this involved a lot of coordination and permitting with those agencies, especially when you're crossing BNSF property. Um, and this is again where they could say, here's the machine we're going to use for this. Here's our casing. Um, there was some concern here about there being timber piles under the railroads. So we actually did some pilot tube investigations here because it was a pretty short drive um, to confirm our alignment, whether there were going to be obstructions there or not. And that helps um, a lot in terms of coordination. Um, the tunnel construction was parallel to the Theofoss waterway. So this required some permitting um, there to do water and with the new outfall, um, there was actually in water work that had to be coordinated with the fish window. Um, open cut beneath an elevated federal interstate. So it runs right by um, I-705. And so the need to actually understand how we're gonna place that in terms of relation to the interstate, what equipment was gonna be used, um, that was a big piece of this. And then the new marine outfall, um, we actually had a, a spot for the marine outfall that we were gonna um, design around. And when we went to do the geotechnical investigations, we actually found shell midden in the area. And while well, you might go, oh no, it was actually a good thing for the city because they had been looking to increase their relationship with the Puyallup tribe. And the Puyallup for a long time had thought that their people had used this area but because it had been covered up and paved over, they didn't have any sort of confirmation of that. So this was actually a way the city used to, to increase the relationship with the tribe. But with that, we had to shift the outfall location um, to a different spot. And that actually required coordination with Tacoma Metro Parks to delay a project they were doing so that we could actually put this outfall underneath that park that they were gonna build. So they've gotten delayed, but been a, been a good partner um, in order to, to facilitate that. There's soil and groundwater contamination. So helping to determine the extent of that, how is the contractor actually gonna handle that? You know, the plans, where is it gonna get disposed of? Those sorts of things that as an owner and a generator of the waste, it's good to understand kind of what's, what's gonna happen there. And then I talked about the, the permits kind of briefly, just, you know, having the contractor there, the builder to say, here's what we're gonna do, not trying to make some assumptions there was really helpful. 
So the lessons learned ultimately um, that the owner's advisor was there for the city too, to help them. This was the first time the city had gone through this process. Um, so that was really helpful for them. Um, the city had to go through some education themselves with DBIA. Um, they also did a lot of project marketing with all the stakeholders, the folks that were impacted by this to, to show the need for the project and, and what they were gonna do. Um, coordination with our contracting department as well was important. This was a new contract um, mechanism for them. So making sure that um, you know, the city's attorney's office was on board and those sorts of things. Um, and then really having that contingency budget in there, helping to create some certainty around schedule and cost um, and really trying to help put some cost to the risks on the project. So there was a risk register developed that said, okay, if this thing happens, here's what we anticipate the cost. And so you actually get some better certainty with what the cost of those risks are because you actually have the builder that can help you price those out. Like I said, early involvement in permitting, getting on board, understanding the, the requirements there and, and developing plans. With that, I will pass it to Alan. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Alan Lord. I'm a, I work for Seattle Public Utilities. I'm the program manager for our Ship Canal Water Quality Project. And so now we're gonna shift over and talk about that. Uh, we're gonna talk about a sub project of that called our Ballard Conveyance Project and KJ is our designer. Uh, so quick, quickly, I'll do an overview of the program, why we're even doing this project. Uh, the city of Seattle has 85 combined sewer outfalls. Many of them overflow too frequently. So uh, we have a consent decree with the Department of Justice, EPA and Ecology to bring our basins into compliance. And King County uh, actually has CSO outfalls in the city of Seattle as well from way back when Metro was formed. And they have a similar deadline, similar consent decree. So we actually partnered on this project. Um, so we're gonna control the biggest offending outfalls in the box shown in the map. Um, we estimate, so we're gonna do this by building a storage, tongue, a storage tank, as Chris mentioned. And we estimate that when the project's operating, we will keep annually about 75 million gallons of combined sewer out of the Ship Canal and Lake Union. So this is a quick overview of what the Ship Canal Water Quality Project is. Um, our storage, well, it's, we have three construction projects remaining. So the first is our storage tunnel. So our, our tank that I mentioned is actually a tunnel. Um, it is 29 million gallon capacity, inside diameter of 18 foot, 10 inches. And that exact dimension was picked because that's a conventional transit tunnel size. That's what Sound Transit is using when they're building all their uh, light rail. The idea being that we can allow a contractor to maybe reuse a tunnel boring machine instead of custom building one. Uh, this project is in construction now and tunneling is ongoing. The next project that we're gonna start, we'll start in January of next year and it's, we call it our Wallingford Conveyance Project. It will build a, I think 54 inch pipe to connect flows from the diversion structure that now sends flows to an outfall. It'll, instead, it'll take them to the storage tunnel. And then the last project that'll go to construction, which is the one we'll talk about today, is our Ballard Conveyance Project. Um, that'll start in 2023. It will also build a pump station at the west end of the tunnel that will be used to drain the tunnel. Uh, the Ballard Conveyance Project is, I think that basin overflows 40 to 50 times a year. It's our single biggest offender for overflows. So it's got pretty high flows, pretty big pipes. So the purpose of this uh, <clears throat> presentation is to talk about risk and, and complexities. And there will be a lot of similarities, I think, to what you just heard in Tacoma. But as an owner, when we're talking about addressing risks and complexities, I, I think I have to start with outreach. Um, a, it's our duty right, to talk to the, the community and stakeholders about why we're doing the project, what's coming, what impacts they can expect. They're paying the bill for this. They're paying our salaries. Um, they should understand what's going on. Also, outreach, public comment periods and things are increasingly required for permits. And we've had experiences with projects coming to a grinding halt when people protest or, or make uh, negative comments in those permit periods. So this outreach is also a risk mitigation process in addition to kind of just being the right thing. So some of the benefits, um, we've spent a lot of time doing outreach. Uh, we've got a, Enviro, which is, is helping us uh, doing a great job. Um, and 
we, we've done a lot of increasing just awareness of not only the project, what's coming, building support, but also the bigger water quality issue of not only this project, but stormwater pollution and combined sewage pollution in, in local waterways. Um, so that's reduced challenges, right, to, like I talked about, permit um, comment periods and things. But we've also, just doing this outreach, we've found ways to maximize benefits for the communities. An example is uh, we had a long-term pedestrian detour we had to put in. We were going to have to build a temporary traffic signal for a new pedestrian crossing. And in talking to the community and some of the people that were going to be really impacted, they actually had wanted a permanent crossing there because they didn't think it was safe to cross this arterial. So we went to the Department of Transportation. We took the money we were going to take to build a temporary kind of a long-term signal and gave it to the Department of Transportation. And they built a permanent signal. And it's really helped in the long run because we've built a lot of goodwill. And now when we have construction impacts, it's just going a lot smoother. Um, and then the final bullet there under benefits that I'll talk about more is, this has been such a dynamic process. Um, like Chris mentioned, there's, there's, you'll see later, there's so much going on on these pipe alignments and changing. And you've got to get out there and talk to the community and find out early what's going on so you can work with people to kind of make it work for everybody. And at the bottom, I just listed, you know, some ways of doing outreach, but um, I think the key is it's really, it's really critical. So about this Ballard Conveyance project, um, our mission was to get flow from the current diversion structure, which is there over to here, which is the west end of the tunnel. So we looked at three different alignments, so the one in blue, and the one in blue is kind of largely in a residential neighborhood. The one in purple is right down a major arterial. And the one in black is through an industrial area that's kind of an unimproved street. Um, and like probably most other projects, we kind of used a multi-criteria decision process, coming up with criteria, weighting and scoring them. So each of these had different costs, risks, operability, impact to community of uh, the public. We ended up choosing the blue alignment. Um, and it is a, a deep alignment, um, but it, it, it scored the best. And this is the diversion, uh, kind of a 3D rendering of the diversion structure at the upstream end, and the way it works. Um, normal flow will just keep going right through three parallel channels. So normal flow goes right, flow goes right down the middle. As flow backs up, it'll hop over a weir into a channel that sends flow to the tunnel to be stored. And if the tunnel gets filled and we close the influent gate, flow will continue to back up in the structure and hop over another weir and end up going back to the outfall. So for, the, for our alignment, the pipe is, is pretty deep. There's high ground water. Um, and for that, and just minimizing impacts of ripping up the entire road and having to pay to restore the road, we, we chose microtunneling. Um, and you know, one thing with microtunneling is it, it, it makes sense. You're not tearing up the whole road. You're impacting a lot less people. But where you are impacting, you've got a shaft there. You're going to be working there for a very long time. So you're really concentrating the impacts in one place, which again goes back to kind of outreach and working with people on this. So the microtunnel will be a two-pass system, a 60-inch pipe and an 84-inch casing. And in the interstitial space, the annular space, we have conduits for fiber optic and power. And the area is just so congested. We're, we're in Ballard, a very dense neighborhood. There's uh, utilities everywhere. So this slide just shows some of our shafts for microtunneling. Just We had to shoehorn them in and come up with these funky configurations to work around underground utilities and overhead utilities. And, and so for both of these shafts, oh, sorry. So the shafts are gonna be secant piles, which are the, the round circle structures. And then the, the boxes that just came in are the kind of permanent structures inside. Um, and then both of these shafts have this red line, which is a duck bank, the main power feed to the West Point treatment plant. So that was uh, you know, off limits. We, we, we had to totally work around that. So there's just a lot going on there. And then I mentioned this is a dynamic area. So, you know, as, as engineers, we think, okay, we'll go out and get our survey. We'll walk the alignment. You know, we can start designing and placing things. And just throughout the process, things just kept changing. So that, that's a rendering of a, um, a multi-use, a, a, a big development that is partway through our design phase. A developer decided that they were going to build this huge development right next to our launch shaft. So 
now we're, we have to, we took the strategy of working with them, developing a memorandum of understanding on who gets to stage where, how we're gonna deal with traffic control, how we're gonna do, deal with utility relocations so they don't impact each other's construction, who restores what on the street. Um, so that was kind of a, a pivot, you know, right in the middle of construction and, and you know, they were putting soil nails to hold their excavation up right along our alignment. So a lot of coordination there that we weren't expecting. And this is, kind of shows the, the, the sidewalk and intersection corner where we had to negotiate, okay, if you finish construction first, you're gonna do this. And if we finish, we're gonna do that. So that was one. And then at the other end of the same drive of microtunnel, another developer decided to buy a block. And um, so we're, we're working with them, but they were a little bit later. We were already done with design. So we're, we're not quite as accommodating to change anything for them. But also on this picture um, at that intersection of Market Street and Shilshol is right where SDOT for over 10 years has been trying to build the Burke Gilman Trail missing link, the final piece of the, the regional bike trail. We've been working with them and they, you know, I feel sorry for them. They've been caught in legal troubles for so long, but we have gone back and forth so many times on, do we show your stuff as existing when our contractor gets there? Or are we gonna go first? Or, you know, that they can't lock down their schedule. And it's again, just everything is so dense and so congested and just trying to make the most of it, give, tell our contractors what to assume when bidding. And if things change, we're just gonna have to be open to having to pay a change order. Um, and then, yeah, above, head, above overhead utilities. This is our upstream diversion structure. Um, you can see there's a lot of city light power lines and other franchise utilities on there that we have to work to coordinate with in addition to PSE and the street. And so that's a sketch of, you know, we're having to design their relocations for them for the overhead lines, get them to do it ahead of time so we can not be delayed in construction. So that's kind of a summary of our risks and complexities. Um, and now Geneva will talk about Georgetown. Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> um, so Ryan and I are gonna speak about Georgetown Wet Weather Treatment Station. And first I wanted to kick us off with a rendering of um, giving a little perspective of what's happening underground. So um, like the other projects, we're managing CSOs and uh, for our basins that we'll touch upon, we are managing those flashy storms. You've got back-to-back -back, um, events. So it just wasn't feasible to have a storage um, or upsizing of existing pipelines strategy. Um, so what you can see in that, um, don't know if I know how to use the pointer, but basically, what was that? There's no pointer. Oh, no pointer at all. Um, so the big concrete block, this is showing our EQ basin. Um, and so right coming from the regulator, we are able to equalize our flows before we head into what Ryan will touch about um, in a few minutes, but our treatment trains before we bring clean effluent out to the Duwamish River. Um, so I did want to start also with our schedule. So we started in 2017 and what's special about this project is there's four discrete contracts. So of course we started with site preparation. There are actually nine sites that were um, under consideration before we landed on the parcels um, that King County did. And then um, kind of in concurrence, we had the three others. You have the treatment station itself, conveyance and outfall. And what I wanna mention here is that outfall was actually broken into two fish windows um, and conveyance went long due to some unanticipated obstructions that we found um, along the way, um, as well as negotiations with the railroad. Um, and we right now are almost at that little black dot, um, quickly approaching substantial completion, which is very exciting. So next, a little basin background. Um, Alan was speaking about all of the CSO outfalls that they're managing with Seattle and it's unique. Um, these are actually King County outfalls that they're managing. So Georgetown Treatment Station is bringing both Brandon and Michigan into compliance with one treatment station. Um, and Ryan, again, we'll talk about some conveyance optimization of how these two outfalls that are about a mile apart um, and that uh, sort of come along the Elliott Bay Interceptor. Um, and that is running just about parallel to the Duwamish River. Um, so again, treatment station, uh, two outfalls. The topography is mainly flat industrial. And so that is definitely contributing to those flashy flows, which I will touch upon um, in our 
hydrology. Um, so for hydraulic optimization, um, since these storms are peaking quickly, we actually were able to include a real-time hydrograph in the bottom left-hand corner. So this is from Elliott Bay Interceptor. And what's happening, your background levels are about um, 1 million gallon per day flows um, at the beginning of that bottom plot. And then quickly within um, about two hours over a 10 hour storm that was eight tenths of an inch of rain, you peak all the way up to 40 million gallons per day. And so if we were going to try to um, manage the flows that are in these two basins with the uh, ship canal storage approach, we would actually need three ship canals um, in size over three. So it's just not feasible. And so that's where you get into um, needing a treatment station. So I am going to pass it now to Ryan to touch more on our treatment-based approach at Georgetown. Is this the green? Is the green? Yeah, green. Okay. Green for go. Great, thank you. Thanks Geneva for starting this off. Um, so as Geneva mentioned, we have two outfalls that we're bringing into control with this project. Um, we do that by tying into the conveyance system in two locations. We tie in both at the Michigan trunk and into the EBI. And then we have a regulator that has a set of gates so we can isolate the Michigan trunk from the EBI completely and bring those flows into the treatment station. And we can also open up gates and bring flows back from the EBI into the treatment station as well. And that's what lets us offload the EBI to the point one mile upstream of the EBI that we can control those discharges. So we have a peak event volume of 85 million gallons. On average, we anticipate treating 67 million gallons per year. And that's over 20 events. And those events, they're all over the place. They can be a few hours long. They can be several days long. So we have 115 million gallon per day screening facility, followed by an equalization basin of 1.1 million gallons. From the equalization basin, flows are pumped up to the treatment station and it goes through ballasted sedimentation, UV disinfection, and then finally travels out to the outfall and is discharged through the new diffusers. So there's a lot of permitting and coordination required with uh, federal, state, and local entities, as well as the railroad, as Geneva mentioned. Um, essentially, the way we uh, approached this was we started very early and we developed both a uh, a permitting matrix and schedule to help us track progress. We developed a memorandum of understanding with the city of Seattle that included that schedule and we had regular meetings between the design team, King County permitting staff and the regulatory agencies to make sure we were staying on schedule, addressing comments quickly and moving through the process. So site investigations, uh, we had extensive site investigations. We knew there were contaminated soils. We weren't able to explore it completely, um, but we had the contractor do potholing two weeks before excavation started so we could find everything that we could. And then in addition, we had the contractors include uh, unit costs in their bids so that if there was additional contaminated soils that we didn't know about, we would know how much it would cost to haul that off to, to the right facilities. Um, also on the photo on the right, it, this shows uh, some of the shoring that was done. It also shows some of our overhead obstructions that we encountered. And it also shows some of the uh, creativity that the contractor demonstrated during the process. The bottom connex there is their tool shed and the top connex is their office on the top. And our Early off on the project, around the time we started doing permitting work, we also started our community outreach. We reached out to a lot of local businesses and the local community groups, developed many partnerships, and we uh, went, got into contact with the uh, design advisory group for this area uh, through the city of Seattle. And what was really interesting about this process was we learned that especially the artistic community in the area did not want us to hide the facility behind facades. They wanted to see all the equipment and see all the pipe, uh, pipes and pumps and everything else. So we have a fence around the facility, but everything's visible. So we have exposed piping, you can see the pumps from the street, et cetera. Um, and as a result of our work with those groups, what we found and developed was the theater of the storm. So the theater of the storm begins when the gates open and flows begin to pass from the conveyance system into the treatment facility. And as those gates open, there's a ring light that illuminates on the regulator building. And that ring light 
ring light is an eight foot diameter circle, just like the eight foot diameter pipe that brings flows to the screens. And then as flow arrives to the EQ basin, lights illuminate um, above the EQ basin, highlighting the odor control. And as flows begin, continue to rise, they hit a set point, the pumps come on, vertical solids handling pumps that pump flow to the facility. And so next lighting comes on at first on the force mains that you can see running up the building in this rendering. And then the lights are timed. So they run in sequence from the influence side of the facility through UV into the effluent side of the facility. And they just run in a sequence. There's a nice flow lighting scheme that goes through, it shows the pulses. Um, and that was a big success. The, the photos here show, this was during our lighting aiming sessions. So the top two photos show the range of lighting that can be provided by the, by the artistic lighting. In general, the facility will run a light blue scheme like you see in the bottom right hand corner. Okay, so the photo on the left in this slide shows the uh, facility during the theater of a storm from the nearby First Avenue Bridge. And we do have one more art installation to go over briefly, and that is the monument uh, to rain. And this is basically a tall polycarbonate tube. It's got essentially a shower head inside of it. And after the event has passed, water showers down from the top of the tube with about the same intensity as the storm that has just passed as a monument to the rain. With that, I'd like to thank everybody else that presented and participated in the NCWA and open the floor up for questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> Talk about the controls on your structure and how that operates. Is that a is that a, a mechanical control or is it a passive control? Mechanical controls. We have bubblers that are set up to control all the gates and a series of valves. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about valve conveyance. It's it's both. Um, so <laughs> as Alan talked about, that diversion structure has weirs in it that allow for control of the HGL within the diversion structure. But then once the storage tunnel fills up. The Ballard Basin is a higher HGL in the system than other basins, so there's actually a gate that closes. Um, so you don't want to take flows from one basin and start to you know overflow them in another basin. So it's it's actually both. Um, Ballard Basin. Thank you. Thank you. I was curious if you're um, looking at any changes in flows. I think all of the projects looked at climate change. Yeah. They were they were all incorporated in the model, looking at long term projections. So extensively. Yeah. Um, I believe the HDL was risen. It was two feet to prepare for climate change, at least for Georgetown. Um, just looking forward at models and projections. And we were looking at sea level rise, but also change rainfall patterns. And using historical data to try and project what that future would look like. You know, what's the rate plus go beyond that. Uh, do you have any idea or an estimate on what the lighting, lighting change is and what the percentage is? Um, I, know, I know the total for all of the artistic features comes to 1% of the project cost. I don't have a dollar figure off the top of my head though. Curious about the operators going to be there in the middle of the night operating. Yeah. That artistic lighting that's beautiful from the outside, but will it support operation and if they need to be able to operate the equipment? Yeah, in general, we think the operators will be down in the control room. If they need to go up to the deck, there's a series of regular white lights that will come on and they mostly drown out the artistic lighting where the operators will be working. We are coordinating with one of the operators to come out during testing to make sure that as those all come on, they're not impeded at all by that lighting. How deep is that uh, storage pipe? Uh, how long is it? What's the maintenance like in the ground? What's the maintenance like in the ground? For the ship canal? Uh, it varies in depth. Uh, I think at the deepest, it's 80 ish feet deep. And then it's got at least a diameter. I, I think it's, a, it's like 35 to 40 at the maybe shallowest in that order. It's 2.7 miles long. Um, and then 
at the upstream end, which is over in Wallingford, which is uh, where we're at, the pump stations at the downstream end. Um, we're, we have a chamber that's gonna fill with influent uh, flow, and then we hold it there. And then after everything's been pumped out, it's like a flushing chamber. So we'll open up the gate and flush down. So we don't think we'll have to go in there very often, but there are big old lift slabs to get a bobcat or whatever in there. Uh, the whole thing is 2.7 miles. Uh, we have several shafts. We have two shafts in the middle, and those are, you know, to get flows from those basins down in uh, the tunnel. Uh, so I don't, I don't actually know what each drive is from like shaft to shaft. Um, that's a good question. One of the challenges was uh, kind of back to the climate change thing. We, we actually stopped design for almost a year, I think, to reevaluate and, and end up upsizing the tunnel just to make darn sure that we were going to have capacity and we don't get a chance to build it again if it's not big enough. Um, I wasn't on, um, you know, I, I wasn't involved in detail in the tunnel design, so I don't really know much about the challenges. We did hit a boulder <laughs> a couple months ago. Um, we have we have McMillan Jacobs this is our tunnel designer, so they do international work. We have Jacobs as our CM team, they do international tunneling work. We have an Italian tunneling contractor, and all of them said it's the biggest boulder they've ever seen on any project. <laughs> so that, that was nice. <laughs> but we, we just ground through it. And we're moving again. Yeah, one of the challenges of working so close to the water is that there's a lot of glacial till in Seattle, so you're going through that in areas which is nice, but then you also have areas of fill, right? Whether that's decent fill that's got some density to it or just, you know, garbage that was placed there too. So, you know, on Ballon Conveyance, that, that alignment that went through the industrial area was just this fill and the subsurface risks associated with going there was just like, that's a lot, so. Please. That's the that's the goal. <laughs> but it's interesting, right? This is a joint project between the city and the county. So it's like, well, how do we deal with this extra? What if your basins overflow more than modeling says? So it, it it's been very interesting. Well, I think that was another topic we just discovered. Our two different Uh, for the big tunnel, the big tunnel is concrete segmental liners. Okay. And then, Chris, what's the micro tunnel type? It's FRP. The, well, at least the carrier pipes FRP. We're given the contract for the, the ability to do a steel casing or um, reinforced concrete casing. Yeah. How long is it take to It's designed, boy, we changed it. <laughs> I can't remember if, if draining it in two days was the original design or if it's actually a little bit longer now, but um, the, the pump station is actually not that big. It's a 12 MPV capacity. Um, and it's either between two or three days is the design um, should be able to drain it back to time. All right, I think we've got time for one more question, if there is any. What, as Murphy's Law would have it, no, they ordered a brand new custom machine, which in some ways is nice, but yeah, the, we made all this effort to, we knew there were sound transit machines in this area, right? We thought we could save money, but they just bought a brand new machine anyway. Save money on the microphone. Yes.
All right. Thank you very much.